Welcome, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you all. We have of the European Social Network. I'm Alfonso, the Chief Executive Officer of ESN. And it's a pleasure, as I said, to uh, welcome you all to this uh, workshop the, online that we are organizing with uh, Deloitte on uh, addressing complex and multiple disadvantages. And specifically, we are going to be talking about uh, co-production, which is a term um, very important for us and indeed an area we've been working on for a number of years. I'm going to share the screen, uh, uh, my screen, just to take you through um, uh, some slides that we have uh, prepared. So I'd like to start by, uh, first of all, telling you a little bit about who we are at the European uh, Social Network. As we said, we are delighted to be able to partner with uh, Deloitte as part of our series of workshops uh, online and to be able to talk about this uh, important element of co-production involving experts by experience in social services planning, implementation, uh, delivery and evaluation. Uh, we at DSM represent those working in social services in public authorities. We've got more than 178 member organizations in 35 countries, including all levels of governance across the board, also uh, inspectors, some research centers, and associations of directors. We bring together policymakers, researchers, and practitioners to facilitate exchange and best practice implementation and to support policy development and uh, uh, practice. This is an these are some examples of our work uh, uh, in this area, particularly around promoting partnerships, integrated care and support uh, to improve people's lives. We had a working group specifically focusing on uh, this area. We uh, also organized a co-production forum back in the year 2019, where we looked at different ways of understanding co-production, developing partnerships uh, between professionals and people using services in areas that related to the design, to the delivery and the inspection of services. And I'd like also to start with a couple of examples on that. But before we did this, uh, of course, the question is why do we do actually, why do we co-produce? And we co-produce because people who use services, of course, feel listened to. They are supported in expressing their views. They can be involved in decision-making processes. And by doing so, of course, their views are taken into account. They are both sharing power, but also responsibility for decision-making. And very importantly, services respond to the needs of those persons. And this is the key element when we are looking at how services better respond to the needs of people for whom they are planned and delivered. So how it is done. So at that uh, co-production forum, we tried to look at different ways in which social services were involving organizations representing people who use uh, services, but also individual experts by experience. Um, and it can happen, as I said earlier on, across all areas of service, planning, delivery, and uh, evaluation. And what it was clear for us is that we realized how those examples showed that uh, their participation is central in individual case work in order to make sure that services respond to the needs and the goals of people who use them. And how do uh, social services involve people who use them? In a different, uh, in a variety of ways. Uh, some of them might involve consultation, it's probably the area which is most used, uh, consulting with organizations representing people who use services, but also with individual experts by experience. Um, it's also about involving uh, people who use services and, and their families in planning and implementing, particularly services in the community. Very important, individual care plans, which are drafted uh, with the by the professional with the person using the service. Uh, personal budgets or peer mentoring is another way of implementing co-production. And less so, but quite a lot of examples of good practice we could identify in relation to involvement uh, in governance and leadership structures and activities. With, uh, with which populations is mostly used? Well, we actually identified uh, with our members that uh, in most cases it's actually used uh, people with disabilities, people with mental health problems, uh, particularly people with physical uh, uh, disabilities. But it's far less used in the areas of migration and particularly with children. So this is actually very interesting for us because it's helped us to look at ways in which uh, our members are promoting participation of children, particularly in areas of child protection, 
which we've uh, seen, which we've realized, that is an area which is actually far less uh, developed than with other population groups. And what outcomes can you get from uh, co-producing social services? Well, to start with, of course, better relationships between people who use services and the professionals, a better motivation in terms of being able to reach your goals, improving quality of life uh, for uh, people who use those services, um, changes which can be made to improve policy and practice in order to make it more efficient, and in particular, to be able to better respond to people's uh, needs. So a couple of examples of those, one in the area of uh, designing care plans, my life, my plan, is an example of how Danish municipalities are working with people with intellectual disabilities in order to be able to help them not only assess their needs, but also reach their goals through their uh, care and support uh, packages. Or another example which I'm, uh, I've actually seen in practice is the Young Care Inspectors in Scotland, which is used by the K, it was implemented by the Care Inspectors, where they train young uh, inspection volunteers who have experience of care. They work with the service inspectors to evaluate together children's services, which help them to provide valuable insights, uh, which are based on the perspective of someone who has care experience, but also uh, they are able to create a quicker uh, connections with children who are in care to be able to hear their views. And of course, I would like to remind you, for those of you who do not know, that um, co-creation, co-production will be the uh, theme of our uh, conference, the uh, European Social Services Conference taking place next year in Antwerp in Belgium at the end of June, where we are going to be looking at examples of co-production in areas of social inclusion, uh, in supporting and managing the workforce of the future and digital technologies. So uh, we are now uh, looking at proposals coming from across the globe and we would like to hear from you if you have experience and examples of co-production that you would like to share with uh, professionals from across the whole of Europe and beyond next year in Antwerp. Some reflections uh, uh, to start the, the, the discussions that are going to take place over the next one and a half hours. I think it's very important when we look at co-production to uh, have a balance between, on the one hand, professional judgment, which is what's studied in the literature and social work, and people's empowerment. I think it's very important to look at um, to look at co-production in terms of having an appropriate uh, legislation, policy, but also the right time and resources devoted to it. It's very important to look at it in terms of how we adapt it to different populations, for instance, intellectual disability or uh, children. And indeed, there are some cases where uh, it's far more difficult to get co-production done, particularly with the most difficult to reach or less uh, heard groups, such as uh, children, uh, migrants and refugees. And with this, I'd like to thank you. And of course, I'd like to give now the floor to Josh, who is going to uh, introduce also the webinar on behalf of Deloitte. Thank you. Great. Thank you, everybody. And if we could show some slides, that's great. Hi, everybody. My name is Josh Yarderson. I am joining you today from Wellington, New Zealand, where it is a blustery three in the morning or three something in the morning. Um, so I lead Deloitte's global practice uh, for the human services. And, and this practice is united around a single mission, and that is to improve the human centricity and the family centricity of our social support ecosystems. Uh, it's an important mission and we have dedicated a lot of resources to helping governments all over the world, particularly governments, uh, again, improve the responsiveness of their safety net. Uh, I wanna say um, thank you to a few people. Um, there are many Canadians on the line today. So thank you for from, uh, from joining us from Canada. A uh, special shout out to those people, particularly Alberta and British Columbia, who are joining us very early in the morning, not quite as early as I am, but nonetheless. And a special thank you to Nick Coxon, who is joining us from Australia, where it is midnight. Uh, so uh, thank you. Next slide, please. So co-production is an absolutely um, in, uh, foundational element of what we call uh, uh, addressing multiple disadvantage. The concept of multiple disadvantage, and, and when I first heard it, I didn't love the term because I thought it was a deficit term. But 
the advocates of the concept actually point out that when talking about multiple disadvantage, we are talking, we are highlighting some of the systemic barriers that exist um, uh, in the context of the way we design and deliver services. So what is multiple disadvantage? So multiple disadvantage is defined as experiencing two or more barriers such as homelessness, reoffending, substance abuse, or mental illness. Um, and the basic premise here is that to effectively address multiple disadvantage, we need to re-architect our social support ecosystems. They can be difficult to navigate. Uh, people need to tell their story many times, which can uh, uh, re-traumatize people. Um, and of course, as Alfonso mentioned, uh, often these services are, are, are built without the actual um, input and co-production from the individuals who are uh, um, who who need the services. Next slide, please. I love this quote, and and I use it often. Currently, uh, there is a fundamental flaw in the way that we deal with multiple death disadvantage. We treat the issues that our 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 our, our users, our citizens face separately when they are connected. This does not change. Things will only get worse with appalling human and fiscal uh, and financial consequences. There's a moral imperative. Uh, and I think that those that are joined on the call today are united by the moral imperative to address uh, uh, multiple disadvantage, but there's also a significant financial imperative as well. Let's move to the next slide. I won't spend a lot of time on this, but the moral imperative and the fiscal, fiscal imperative is grounded by the fact that incidences of multiple disadvantage are growing, growing across the world. And there's some start statistics here focused on the European Union, but this is a global phenomenon. And as I mentioned, I'm joining you from Wellington, New Zealand today. Yes, last week I was in, or earlier in the week, I was in Australia, I spend most of my time in Canada and our clients tell us that um, people are falling through the cracks, that uh, we, are, we spend way too much money on addressing um, post hoc or addressing acute cases as opposed to orientating our models towards prevention. And again, our social safety nets and our social safety ecosystems uh, are, 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 are strained because of the fact that we are reorientating people after they uh, face acute uh, issues as opposed to being preemptive. Next slide, please. And the UK, and particularly um, in the context of uh, a program fulfilling lives, did an excellent job of surfacing the extent of the issue in, in England specifically. And, um, you know, their research identified that in England alone, there are nearly 400,000 people who face at least three or of four of life's, life's harshest disadvantages, that there are 17,000 people experiencing homelessness, of which 70% of them are women, 90% are out of work, and only 16% uh, report having a good or very good uh, quality of life. As I mentioned, there's clearly a moral imperative to helping these individuals uh, uh, address the challenges that they're facing in an integrated way. But there's also an economic imperative and the, the cumulative cost of addressing multiple needs in England alone is uh, more than a billion and up to $2 billion a year. That's a huge fiscal strain on our social safety nets. So again, moral imperative and the fiscal imperative. Let's move to the next slide. Okay, I just, in the interest of time, let's go to the next one actually, and we'll end here. So my team is spending a lot of time thinking about the architecture of addressing complex needs and multiple disadvantage. One of the challenges that I see across our ecosystems is that we're very good in designing pilots and prototypes and testing integrated care models but inevitably we struggle with their scaling. 
So what does good look like from a scaled perspective? And there's a, I won't spend a lot of time here because I know these are going to surface as we discuss. So certainly the vision where everybody has the right to dignity and a co-created, a co-produced path to integration into the community where we've got a range of partnerships that are joined up, right? And joined up on the ground as opposed to focusing too much on the machinery of government. Okay. Um, where data is shared and uh, services are devolved and delivered, again, at the community level. Okay. Again, this is the architecture. Next slide. And the business case is becoming clearer and clearer. Next slide, please. Great. Um, so if we look at uh, an example out of the UK, Fulfilling Lives, um, you know, the integrated on the ground approach is reduced levels of need and risk and fewer people are arrested, fewer people are, evict are evicted, few people are sleeping on the street. Again, the moral imperative, but also the fiscal and the out outcomes of these models from a fiscal point of view, from a financial point of view, the Fulfilling Lives program saved over 700 pounds per person per year, uh, which is an amazing result. So again, meeting the twin objective of better outcomes and more effective and efficient service delivery. So with that, we're going to get to some really great case studies. Um, uh, I'm, I'm pleased that we have um, the good folks from Essex joining us, who is uh, leading a program now called Changing Futures. Uh, Charlene, I'm going to pass it over to you to sort of, I think, uh, introduce our two speakers and then and then move on to the case studies. Thank you, Josh. Um, I'm Charlene Packham. I'm a director with Deloitte Canada. Really pleased to be here today. Um, work very closely with Josh in the human service sector practice, and uh, so this is this is all very near and dear to my heart. Um, just a couple of quick things before I introduce the speakers. Um, we are going to have Louise and Dr. Andre um, present their case studies, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. So you should have a Q&A button um, on your screen. Please use that. Um, we'll do the same thing for the panel as well. And I'll apologize in advance if we can't get to all the questions. We expect uh, people will have lots of them, but we will, we will try to answer as many as we can in the time frame. Um, with that, uh, given that you know many people are starting their day, ending their day, some folks are up really late or getting up really early. I'm also going to play a bit of a timekeeping role uh, to make sure that that we respect the 90 minutes we have to get through what is a, an incredibly important um, and meaty topic to talk about. But with that said, we will dive into it um, and get uh, get going with the presentations. Um, it's a pleasure to introduce Louise Prance. Louise is System Change Lead for Changing Futures in Essex, um, working for Phoenix Futures. Louise is currently overseeing the frontline delivery of the program, supporting full circle teams in their intensive work for Changing Futures cohorts. Louise is responsible for the lived experience lead role and service manager role for the Phoenix Hosts Housing Project. She's gained over 17 years of experience working within the prison and community settings of criminal justice, substance misuse, and complex needs fields in Essex. Having joined Phoenix Futures in 2016, Louise has undertaken a variety of operational management roles, including prison link, delivery, oversight, and expansion of the intensive complex needs service within Full Circle and community team member. Following Louise will be Dr. Mario Andre. Uh, Dr. Andre has a PhD in sociology. He's the director of the unit mission to the program Lisbon, a city for all ages, which he'll be presenting on. Over the last 20 years, he's been responsible for directing and coordinating several projects and programs, um, as well as services in the social service and health promotion areas, particularly in the development of community-based collaborative partnerships. So thank you both for being here. And Louise, I will turn it over to you. Many thanks, Charlene. I'm going to share my screen. Um, okay. Is that working? Can everybody see that? I'd like to check. You can see that, Charlene, yes? Yes. Lovely. Okay. So my name's Louise. As, it, as Charlene, thank you for introducing me. I have I am the system change lead for changing futures in Essex. 
um, which is a great privilege to do. Um, so our program in Essex is, um, it's a great project. It's a follow on from Fulfilling Lives, which just has mentioned. Um, so thank you very much for that. And we are going to have the opportunity today, I want to be able to share with you some of the things that we've been doing in Essex under the Changing Futures program, um, and just kind of highlight everything that's been said already so far and how we're kind of applying that within our area. Um, Phoenix Futures has been commissioned by Essex County Council to deliver support services to individuals with complex and multiple needs since 2016. Our local service full circle supports those within or have had contact with criminal justice systems, but have also have a, no a number of other needs, which may include substance misuse, mental or physical health needs, homelessness, neurodiversity, as well as other socially excluding difficulties. We offer intensive and persistent support to individuals within our service. By offering time and commitment over long periods of time, we were able to help individuals to not only develop trusting services and the system, but also in the processes that can help them. We work hard to engage and bring up partners together for the need of the plan for the individual by plan joint planning and shared responsibilities. Being part of Changing Futures has enabled us to expand the work that we've been delivering to further engage partners and local services to work in a more cohesive, joined up way. What does that mean at an individual level? The work we deliver is in line, aligned with the meme approach, which is make every adult matter, which is putting the individual at the center and using a certain person-centered approach. We will work with an individual for however long is required. And this can be from a few months up to 18 months and beyond, depending on what their individual need is. At a service level, engaging local services to take a no wrong door approach has been really key to the work we deliver under Changing Futures. To aid this, we um, invited districts to, um, to apply for funding to deliver projects locally based on identified gaps and needs in their areas. Examples of these are mental health and complex needs navigators with peer support workers aligned to them, working alongside rough sleeper initiatives across the county. Development of community gardens to aim meaningful activities and well-being um, for many who had previously been excluded from these kind of activities because of their complex needs. Um, we have commissioned um, SOS buses which go out into more rural areas and provide outreach and a one-stop shop so that partners can all attend at the same time and actually be there and those more restricted individuals can access services instead of expecting them to come into towns and cities, which quite often financially is difficult. We've developed and delivered training to partners on such subjects as trauma-informed approach. We have had some recent training delivered um, on gypsy and traveler communities to understand and improve their understanding of the individual community's needs and reducing stigma against them. At a system level, we're trying to support and test and, and encourage that uh, siloed funding to stop, stop working in that way. Delivery of services and that joint up working is works we know works better in Essex. Um, and it helps encourage partners to develop and use lived experience and co-production input into this service delivery. And we've done that by working with um, our commissioners and I'll go on further about our Essex community recovery um, service but we also have peer mentor programs. And these are people who have come through our services and now have the opportunity to input back into delivery and to be part of change, which is a really positive thing. A lot of what we said can be best shown by sharing one individual's experience. I'd like to introduce you to Danny. Danny is one of many examples of individuals we work with under Changing Futures who has endured stigma due to his multiple and complex needs. Danny is 32. He's had escalating substance use since the age of 15. By age 20, Danny had daily use of alcohol, crack cocaine and heroin. He's had numerous interactions with the criminal justice system and many custodial sentences linked to his substance use. Danny has a history of street homelessness, sofa surfing, staying with friends and failed accommodation. He has a mental health diagnosis, which he actually received whilst in prison, 
um, rather than when he was in the community. This was due to um, at difficulty in accessing mental health services because of reaching thresholds, which are often excluding people like him. Um, the exclusion often comes because there's substance misuse and this influences whether they can actually be accepted or they have to address their substance misuse before mental health can be addressed, which is a common issue and a common barrier. Danny first worked with us um, at Full Circle in 2018 under our intensive support service and has had several interactions with us over the years between custodial sentences. Danny was more recently referred back to us in December 21, following release from prison and placed onto our Change and Futures cohort. Danny was released homeless, and after a month living on the streets, he was supported by his practitioner, his dedicated practitioner, into temporary accommodation, while duty was explored by the local authority. An important part of Changing Futures is that all individuals in our cohorts are discussed at our six weekly MDT meetings with partners. This helps to ensure that all parties are aware of care planning, allows discussion on individual support needs and who is best placed to take these forward. This ensures that ownership sits with us all rather than just one service. <clears throat> so what does engagement in services mean for Danny? These are his experiences. Danny became stable on substitute prescribing. In his case, this was methadone and he was engaging in a planned reduction. He completely stopped using illicit class A drugs and, for, and reduced his alcohol intake from 10 to 15 cans of strong cider daily to occasional weekend social drinking. With support from his practitioner, Danny was able to maintain his accommodation. He kept his tick clean and tidy, he paid all his bills and he was debt free. There had been no antisocial behaviour reported or complaints from neighbours whilst he was in his temporary accommodation. Danny was in a stable relationship and was to become a father. He engaged with all requirements under his probation order and worked intensely with, social, with any social care requirements regarding his unborn child. Through the above, there was a vast improvement in his personal well-being and mental health. So the outcomes. The outcomes for Danny, after maintaining his temporary accommodation for a three month period um, and engaging with services and making vast changes to his lifestyle and well-being, 11 months later, the local authority actually reviewed his homeless application and found Danny intentionally homeless. Based on information dating back to 2018, he was given notice to quit and duty was ended. This decision was based on Danny being evicted from a shared house and going to prison. The actual circumstances for Danny at that time in 2018 was that yes, he was evicted from a shared house following an altercation with another resident after Danny actually found this person in his room. This, this individual was taking his belongings. He reacted. It was not appropriate, but this led to him being evicted and not the other resident. This led to Danny being street homeless again and returning to offending behaviour, and he was arrested and went back to prison. At this time, Danny had a chaotic lifestyle and was battling past trauma. He was suffered as a young adult. So he was self-medicating with class A drugs and was back in that cycle of chaos. He did not have a support structure around him in 2018. The decision by the local authority was challenged on behalf and with Danny by his full circle, Change of Futures practitioner. And we followed their right to appeal process. Evidence was gathered from Danny's support agencies at this time. This included probation, prescribing services, social care, as well as his parents who all advocated on how Danny had, be, had come on and how far he'd, he'd moved forward since 2018. And this was put to the investigating officer as part of his appeal. Following the appeal, the decision was actually overturned and duty was given and Danny was moved into permanent accommodation. So the stigma that goes alongside our clients, um, the impact of stigma on individuals with multiple and complex needs can be devastating. Through this case study, which is one of many, many, many that we have worked with, um, highlights that legislation does not recognise progress. In the case of Danny, it's housing legislation, but we have found this in the cases across a lot of sectors. 
the belief that people cannot change and grow. Outdated information holds people back. Um, a lot of people we work with have a past. And yes, this cannot be ignored. But there needs to be an understanding of what changes can and have been made by an individual. People often fall through the gaps, especially if there's not services out looking for them or advocating for them. And this is something that we, we are very good at and we endeavour to complete and do for every single individual that comes through our service. Um, the outcomes can be very different. Danny would never have pursued an appeal against housing legislation without the support of services around him. Setbacks affect early recovery. And Danny was in early recovery. 11 months is not wrong when you're still working within services. And individuals are often ill-equipped or intimidated by how to address service decisions and what outcomes can be. There are too many barriers for complex individuals to navigate legislation. The actual next step for Danny in this circumstance would have been a judicial review. That would have cost him £400 and he did not have that. So not only had he already been, faced barriers to accommodation based on his past, the actual appeal process excludes him and many others from pursuing, pursuing a positive outcome. So it's time to change. How do we all change the approach and stigma aimed at those individuals with multiple and complex needs? There needs to be a person-centered approach, looking at the whole person, looking at all needs and not what they are just presenting to any given service. Robust information sharing systems to reduce re-traumatizing. Individuals such as Danny say they are forever having to retell their story. And a no wrong door approach. Services need to be equipped. We need to be able to support services to manage all needs. And if they cannot or they don't have the means for that, to have a full awareness of services that are out there who are best to support and advocate for an individual to use their specialism. Lived experience and peer support should be the norm in all services. In Essex, we have worked really hard with that. And we have the Essex Recovery Foundation, which actually comes from Ben Hughes' vision, not only to establish a, long live, a strong lived experience community within treatment services in Essex, but to commission treatment services by the people for the people. Consideration for joint commissioning to reduce siloed funding streams and service delivery. This allows individuals to access stronger systems where all sectors have an invested interest and reduces duplication. Change is happening and it's often very slow, but it is all our responsibility to deliver accessible services which are fit for purpose and meet the, nodes, the, meet the demands of those in need. Thank you. Thank you very much, Louise. Um, Dr. Andre, we're going to move it over to you and then we'll, we'll move to questions. Thank you very much to, for everyone. First of all, thank you for the organizer of this webinar, European Social Network and Deloitte. And uh, also uh, say uh, uh, congratulations to our participants that we have almost 120 participants here. So uh, it is a pleasure uh, to, to me to present you our, our experience uh, with the Project Radar that uh, is uh, one of the project projects uh, involved in the uh, most uh, big program in, here in Lisbon, that is the program, a city for all ages program that uh, wants to uh, have an, an integrated and, uh, and uh, collaborative approach for the uh, aging and the longevity here in the, in the city of, of Lisbon. So um, this, uh, this radar project, uh, is um, uh, a project that to go uh, to face uh, a problem here in Lisbon. Real Lisbon is a, a, a old city, a, a aging city. Uh, remember that here in, in Lisbon, uh, people with 65 or more as 127,000, and almost 50, 55,000 live alone uh, or uh, with someone with the same age. And uh, most of these uh, people live in situation of uh, social isolation, unwanted loneliness, and social vulnerability. So 
Uh, uh, it is a problem that is known here in Lisbon for a long time, uh, but uh, all approaches that we have before, it was uh, approaches in silos, and now we try to uh, approach this problem with the, in based in a, a collaborative uh, uh, a collaborative partnership. So uh, the, the the main the, the the main organization responsible for social action here in the city of Lisbon, uh, this, the, the city council of Santa Casa, uh, established this collaborative partnership in order in order to let develop local micro networks uh, with the involvement of the neighborhoods and the local markets as uh, community radars. So uh, these uh, projects try not only to involve the organizations uh, and uh, to try to uh, share information, share resources between the, the organizations, but, but also want to have uh, an approach to uh, the neighborhoods, to the communities. So uh, we think that uh, we uh, involve the, the local market. Uh, we gonna uh, that we're going to have more information and sensitive information about the situations that happen in the uh, local communities. Uh, uh, for instance, people that don't come to the to the bakery or don't come to the uh, uh, local markets, and the, the, these uh, local agents can have information that is very important to uh, uh, understand uh, uh, more uh, in a micro uh, networks uh, to understand more the situations of of, of the people. Uh, that uh, live uh, alone and and that live in the uh, loneliness. Uh, the, the partners of of Project Radar, there are thirty partners now. Uh, you know the, the city, the city hall of Lisbon, and the the uh, house of mercy of Lisbon, my institution, Santa Casa da Misericórdia de Lisboa, the Social Security Institute, the Regional Health Administration. The public security policy that is very important because public security have information and they have uh, uh, special uh, services uh, for uh, local uh, policy uh, policing, and, and the, the twenty four parishes uh, councils of the city of uh, Lisbon. So there are thirty organizations that uh, share information, uh, share uh, uh, resources and uh, um, uh, to a better approach to the, this uh, problem, problematic situation here uh, in Lisbon. Uh, all the information that uh, we have about the people there uh, are involved, there are uh, uh, in the, in the, in the uh, uh, radar project, uh, the, all the information are placed in the uh, digital platform of the project, project radar, that, that is a, a, a simple platform that is a, a SharePoint uh, from, uh, from uh, the um, uh, a simple share, uh, share prime, uh, share, SharePoint. And this information uh, about the people with you are integrated into a, this collaborative uh, platform, this SharePoint online, and uh, information are shared by the 30 partner organizations of uh, the, this uh, collaborative partnership. So uh, you, you can understand that is uh, very important uh, the, kind, the, the, the kind of information that you have in this platform. So the, the information is very transversal to the whole organization. It is not a, a specific uh, organization than the, uh, the uh, sensitive for any part. For, for instance, there are no organizations about, about uh, no information about the clinical aspects or about psychological specific aspects or about social service specific ex, uh, uh, assets, but uh, fundamentally information that are trans transversal uh, for the, the many uh, groups of uh, professional groups that are involved. In the uh, of the thirty partner organizations, so in order to promote active participation in in, in, in of these people 
in the activities carried out in the, the territories and also to activate the appropriate resources to the needs of, of these people. So uh, I'm going to tell you uh, uh, simply the three phases of the project. The projects uh, begin in, 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 nine, in 2019. Uh, it was uh, made as a survey that was carried in the 24 parishes of Lisbon, in which it was integrated in the, our platform about 29,000 people. Uh, it is 65 years or more, and they were interviewed uh, uh, and had adhered to the project. Uh, this correspond about 23% uh, of age uh, 65 uh, in, the, in the city of Lisbon. So it is a number very important because it, 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 it permits to uh, catapult the, 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 the project and uh, make, make it stronger. Uh, so uh, between 20 and 21, the project radar has adapted to the pandemic situation. And that the, this time was very important because all the organizations understand better the importance of sharing information, of sharing resources, because the, uh, during the, the, the pandemic situation, people go to, to their houses and, and stay in low lockdown. And uh, most of them don't know how to uh, go to the resources that was developed in the, in the, in the pandemic situation. And uh, we, we, with, with our platform, we can uh, call them by telephone and uh, 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 understand the situations that they were and uh, to uh, orientate them to the resources that that, that was developed in the, in the, in the local uh, communities. And the uh, pandemic, uh, pandemic um, situation was uh, uh, very important to Radar Project because all of the participants of all, all of the organization of the partner of the partner organizations uh, be aware the importance of sharing information and of sharing resources and these uh, synergies that was created with this this uh, sharing uh, situation it was very important for the the, the, the radar project currently uh, of course the radar project is re-establishing re the, the ground activities, uh, carrying out uh, uh, actions with local partners, with especially with parishes, parish councils, and the public security uh, police patrollers, in order to uh, involve local business, uh, also local markets, uh, and identify people that want to join uh, the project. Then I can give you some uh, numbers. Uh, today we have uh, Sorry, we have about uh, uh, thirty-six thousand people in a, in a, uh, integrated in out uh, in our platform. That is a number very important. We think in twenty twenty-six we will have about uh, forty-five thousand people integrated. Is uh, our aim? Uh, uh, so in the uh, the local market. We have the, that we named the, the community radars. We have now uh, 4,530 uh, community radars. So there are local markets that are involved in the project. There, uh, there are, uh, 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 with attention, what happens in the local communities. And if something happens, they can phone us about, about the, uh, our call center and uh, the, uh, relate, uh, relate the, uh, the, the, the situation they, they see, and then we activate our researchers uh, to go to uh, evaluate the situation and uh, put uh, the situation uh, uh, in the, in the uh, services of the community that, that exist to, to respond they, to their needs. Uh, it is important because pharmacies, all of the pharmacies of the Lisbon city are in, involved uh, in the project. Uh, the, all of the pharmacies of Lisbon is, uh, is, is almost two, 300, 300 pharmacies are uh, in, integrated uh, in the community radars. And they can, you can imagine the, the importance of the involvement of the pharmacies. So now, uh, with the, the 30 partner organization, we have uh, almost 
341 focal points of the radar digital platform. You see, we can uh, uh, catapult the uh, researches uh, uh, with all these 30 uh, 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 organizations, partner organizations. Now we are doing about uh, 1,000 uh, phone calls because one of the components of this radar project is the contact people with the phone uh, who understand the situations that, that they are and uh, also to uh, say to the people to come to the community for uh, events or, or uh, other things that happen in the communities for the people to uh, get uh, out of their, their homes and uh, participate and involve in the, in the community. Uh, so, uh, we, for instance, this year we have about 3,753 new additions, new people that are integrated in Protifor. And uh, we, uh, until September 2023, this year, we have uh, developed uh, eight, uh, almost 900 outdoor activities. Uh, these outdoor activities, so we are, uh, like I said, uh, most of them are made with the policy, the local pat patrollers, uh, and we go to the people, we go uh, talk to the people, present the, the, the project, and uh, the, the say to the people to be aware and involved in this project. It, it is, this uh, uh, action, street actions are very, very important and are the, 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 the principal um, action that uh, we made. Uh, we do also uh, many uh, 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 presentations in the uh, libraries and, and other, other local, every, every event that uh, occurs in the communities, we try to be present and to uh, the, transport the, the, uh, the information and then to people comprehend, to better comprehend the project, but because the project is, to the project is very important, the trust, the confidence that people, that the citizens have in the project. So it is very, very important to talk with the people, make them to understand what uh, is in the cause. Um, you, you have the radar coffee, it is a, an, an activity that we develop also. We go to a, a community radar, and uh, we, then we make a tutorial with, uh, with the people that are integrated in the platform and talk with them the importance of uh, everyone be aware uh, of the situation of the people, vulnerable people that uh, uh, they can uh, meet uh, in their streets, in their, in their neighborhoods. In their, uh, so it is important to, because we think that everyone, every citizen can be uh, radar uh, in the individual radar and every people uh, if every people is aware of, of the situation we are sure that um, uh, no one gets behind uh, and the uh, vulnerable situations are identified um, we also have um, the, uh, activities uh, with uh, with the people in the in local communities so they uh, understand what's happening in the space because uh, uh, something they'd like to change in their communities, in their neighborhoods. This is very important to evolve not on the partners, uh, in this case the, the parish, uh, but uh, also to involve people in the program, to evolve people in Project Radar. We have also a, a, a mobile unit that uh, uh, we, we try to develop actions and who uh, uh, do the, the, the actions in the, our uh, mobile un units. Here, uh, or most of them are uh, developed by the pharmacies. Uh, so they do uh, uh, actions to the people to uh, arterial tension or mail or information uh, about uh, nutrition or information about uh, uh, other things that get, that we can. But uh, the the mobile unit is a mean, not not a hand. Uh, so it's a mean because it facilitates our presence in the territories. It facilitates our involvement of uh, the communities. So uh, it is this I have to present you. I don't uh, I don't know. 
Thank you very much. Thank you so much, um, both of you, uh, Louise and, and uh, Mario. Really, really appreciate uh, you sharing. Certainly saw some some common themes there. We had a couple of questions in the chat. I'm just, I'm mindful of the time. So what I think I'd like to do, if it's okay with you, Louise and Mario, is move to the panel and then circle back on like a broader Q&A right at the end, just to make sure we give everybody um, time to do that. And um, we can take it from there. I'm seeing nodding heads, so so we'll do it that way. So with that, we're gonna move to our, our panel. Um, and uh, I'm gonna just briefly introduce uh, folks and we'll, we'll jump right into some questions. So uh, our first panelist is Andy Williams. Andy has 25 years experience working with people who have experienced homelessness, mental ill health, substance use, um, and have been involved in the criminal justice system. Since 2004, he specialized in co-production, in governance, strategic decision-making, organizational change, employing people with lived experience, and developing lived experience forums at St. Mungo's, Hestia, and Revolving Doors. With St. Mungo's, he helped establish the first recovery college outside of the National Health Service, NHS. And he is the strategic lead for all revolving doors lived experience projects, including establishing peer support within NHS, um, liaison and diversion services. He's currently supporting co-production in the 15 Partnerships in Changing Futures program and has previously supported the National Lottery's Fulfilling Lives and helped through crisis programs partnerships to embed lived experience in their work. He's led training and development programs across co-production, peer research and trauma-informed approaches. Next, we have Nick Coxon. Nick is passionate about increasing equity and opportunity. It's grounded in his curiosity about the world and all its differences, dedication to community and optimism for a better future. Justice and service to others are innate values that have been shaped by his lived experience, commitment to volunteering and professional pursuits in social policy. Over the last 10 years, Nick has played a key role in significant social policy reforms in Australia. He's advised the Royal Commission into Victoria's mental health system, contributed to the development and implementation of the National Disability Insurance Scheme, and most recently designed a sophisticated program to support vulnerable families across justice and human service. He's recognized for his innovation and thoughtfulness brought to his work and his commitment to improved outcomes. Currently, he's the director of Better Connected Care, a long-term Victorian government reform that will deliver outcomes for people who use multiple government services, particularly acute services. Um, this program establishes an integrated and place-based service system to ensure clients are able to access services to meet their needs earlier and help them make a lasting change in their lives. We also have Anne Helferty joining us today. Anne's a graduate of the University of College Dublin with a degree in social work. She's worked in the local authority sector for over 40 years and is currently the Chief Housing Welfare Officer in Dublin City Council, managing the social work section. She's responsible for overall service delivery, further development of services in this area, and manages the team who provide the social work service to the Dublin City Council tenants, travelers, and those living in temporary homeless accommodation under the remit of the council's homeless services. The Exceptional Social Ground Scheme, a process whereby applicants can apply to be considered for priority on the housing list on the basis of extremely serious social need, a neighborhood mediation service, and the National Local Authority Lead in the Sex Offenders Risk Assessment um, and Management Sorum in the National Sorum uh, Coordinate, sorry, in the National Sorum Co-located Office. Um, this program has a statutory basis, supports enhanced levels of cooperation and coordination between a number of uh, a number of different organizations. She's a practice teacher for both Trinity College in Dublin and University College Dublin and is passionate about supporting social work student learning. And she's actively involved in advocating and supporting the creation of a joint vision for the role of social work service. And then last but certainly not least, we have Ben Hughes. Uh, having worked in the criminal justice system, trained as a therapist, counselor, and supported the implementation of early prison drug treatment services in the 90s, Ben moved to work as the Drug and Alcohol Action Team Coordinator and Commissioner of Drug and Alcohol Services in 2000. He managed a complex local partnership through a period of change with the creation of the National Treatment Agency and the significant additional resources and scrutiny. As an independent consultant, he worked in commissioning and development roles and has also worked in Europe with EU create session countries, supporting the development of local and national policy strategy and delivery frameworks in the substance misuse area. Ben moved to Essex County Council in 2007 as strategic lead for the substance misuse agenda 
and is now head of well-being and public health at Essex County Council, Council with responsibility for drug and alcohol services, health and justice commissioning, housing related support and homelessness, complex needs and elements of domestic abuse commissioning. Most recently, he created the Essex Recovery Foundation, a charity comprising lived and living experience that is taking commissioning responsibility and substance misuse services in Essex, um, seeing a shift to, to community leadership and true co-production, which is, of course, a theme we're, we're talking about today. So you can see this is quite an esteemed panel of experts um, in Europe and <clears throat> Australia that we have here. Um, my first question is going to go to you, Andy. Um, I'm wondering, Andy, if you can talk a little bit about what Revolving Doors is in the next few minutes um, and the National Expert Citizen Group and what role they play in emerging frameworks in the UK to support those facing multiple disadvantage. Um, and as part of that response, can you also give us your definition of co-production and how it should work on the ground? Excellent. Okay. Thank you, Charlene. And thank you for the introduction. Okay. Starting off with revolving doors. So our aim as an organization is criminal justice reform. So to reform the criminal justice system and the kind of services within and around that, the group we work for and represent is the people who've had repeat contact with the criminal justice system. And that repeat contact is driven by unmet health needs, an unmet social need. So typically that group of people will be committing low level offences. So we're talking things like shoplifting, minor drug offences. And again, those offences are driven by their unmet health and social needs, that multiple disadvantage we've been talking about today. And essentially these are people who are let down and failed by the system. So that's our aim for the criminal justice reform. In terms of who we work with, so we work with, you mentioned National Health Service, NHS, we work with, we work across a lot of all the relevant government departments, we work with services, we work with local authorities. I think the simplest way of explaining what our aim is as an organisation is that our group of people are looking to represent a diverted away from the criminal justice system, especially prison is only re-traumatises people. Uh, and you're not going to get to the root causes of the issues that drive people to be in touch with the criminal justice system if you look at it through a criminal lens. So really trying to get it looked from a health support treatment point of view. So that's our aim as an organisation. We're a small team. It's only 14 members of staff, but our model is based on co-production. So we've got lived experience members who've had experience with the revolving door from across the country. Everything we do is done with them they drive drive absolutely everything so co-production is at the heart of what we do and we couldn't exist the model wouldn't work what we do would not work without them on to the necg the national expert citizens group is a group independent of us it's they are completely independent our role is to support enable and facilitate them uh, they're essentially at the moment they're the lived experience representative group from across the change in futures program so from those 15 changing futures areas we have at least two members with lived experience and that forms the national group very very well organized very well structured the group has a clear set of objectives a clear strategy that they're trying to drive through at the moment so their role what they do work with government we have them working at a government level so work with department leveling up and housing communities DLUC they're the department that are leading on the changing futures program but they work across government with all the relevant departments really that a lot of what they're doing is that in the background trying to shape and inform strategy so you know some of the work we've done across government departments we worked with Dame Carol Black who a couple of years ago did a review of drug treatment services which led to the new drug treatment strategy we're involved in the development of the 10 year 10 year mental health plan we've recently done a lot of work with nhs and uh public health department in government uh around how they better support people experiencing co-occurring mental health and substance use but i think really what the role of the group is is to challenge you know we really are there to challenge we the necg as a group has some very strong views around services and the cultural approach to co-occurring needs and that separation, uh, something Louise talked about. You know, you, you you look at issues separately, not holistically. It doesn't work. That's something we challenge the system. With. The whole approach to risk that holds people back, we're really challenging that at the moment. Uh, so that's the NECG. On to my definition of co-production. I mean, for me, I think co-production is basically it's the best way to develop, design and deliver 
services. I think all the problems that we're talking about on this webinar, co-production for me is the process for how we're going to get the answers, how, we, how we're going to solve this. So it's really, it's about solutions. It's about creativity. I think my favorite quote really that sums up why we need co-production for me is that those closest to the problem are closest to the solution but furthest from power and resources. That's it. That's why we're doing this. And I see that all the time. And I'm working with the NECG and our other lived experience groups. As I'm listening to people, I'm hearing the answers all the time. If you ever say to our lived experience members of the NECG, what should this service look like? How should it work? It's the easiest question for them to answer. And they can articulate that so clearly. I think the challenge is for the system to then embed it. I think as... Uh, Josh talked about in, in the introduction, the challenge is scaling it up and, and embedding that. So in terms of co-production, how we do that on the ground, what that actually looks like, I mean, I'm going to be really quick on this. You know, it's about addressing power. It's about getting that equal partnership between lived and learned experience and getting the most power from that. It's about creating accessible spaces. This isn't about putting individuals on board meetings with lived experience. This is not all going to be done through those formal structures. It's about creating those neutral, empowering, creative spaces where people can work. All those barriers are removed and people can work in equal partnership. It's about training, often training for the professionals as well, how to work in that different, more accessible world, people with lived experience, people with lived experience as well. It's about skilling them up. It's in training them. It's about payment. It's about reward and recognition. I think last thing I would like to say, just certainly on England, England perspective, organizations and areas and people who are doing this best are people who invest in it so it's areas where they think we want staff to make co-production happen we're going to fund staff to do this that's where it's better and so if you're serious about co-production invest in it thank you andy you touched on a lot of i think very powerful themes that i suspect are going to come out as we continue on but i love that quote and it is so true. And I uh, imagine everybody across the world sees that in uh, in the delivery of service um, for folks in need. Nick, I'm going to move to you now. Uh, you've recently completed a bit of a, a world tour, if you will, researching whole of person approaches to multiple disadvantage. And I know you've done a ton of work. It's going to be tough to <laughs> get this uh, done in a short, sweet time frame. But can you take a couple of minutes to talk about some of the common features that you're seeing in that research? Um, and how the state of Victoria Better Connected Care Initiative um, is helping onboard the lessons you've learned in your travel. Of course, um, thanks for having me today. And uh, it will be good for you to understand that the common features that I'll talk about today have been uh, common across all of the presentations. So I'll whip through them. Uh, but I've recently returned from two months across uh, the UK and Canada, looking at what are these features and how can we drive whole of system change for people who are facing multiple disadvantage. So the first thing that I saw time and time again across these initiatives was strong leadership and very strong leadership, the type of leadership that can uh, confront bureaucratic constraints and can uh, kind of handle changing political mandates and really have that long-term commitment to change. Um, and I'm thinking particularly of system managers and um, sometimes CEOs of local councils, for example, in the UK, where they were able to kind of look at the kind of policy uh, landscape above and decide that they're going to take the best bits, but really drive what they see is really important for change on the ground. And, you know, many of you will, be uh, uh, will know of the Wigan deal um, uh, about a decade ago and the the, the local council area near Manchester, where um, some really strong political and uh, senior official leadership there were able to do some really transformative stuff across their system to really change outcomes and push more and more uh, power down to uh, down to people. The second one, which is really linked to that, is the long term commitment to change. So whole of system change is a long term mission. There are sometimes really good pilots, really good projects, but scaling is key. And those programs that are able to focus on scaling and support that really, really make the difference on the ground. And changing futures that Louise spoke to and Andy spoke to, that's one good example where you're looking at pockets across the UK and actually committing in a uh, kind of in a in a long-term sense to driving and supporting that change. Um, one academic actually put it to me that in the UK, this kind of decade or so of uh, health and social care reforms has been pilot rich, but systems poor. And that's what really needs to be addressed. The final one I'll talk to is a strong focus on design. 
So this is about um, service design approaches, which don't, uh, which really try to unpack and understand the problem rather than jumping to a predetermined solution. As we heard um, today, and this is what I heard time and time again, engaging with communities is the only way to do this effectively. Um, as well as working through what the community needs, you also uncover latent community assets. So things that are already happening in communities that government can enhance and support and enable. And that's something that came up time and time again. And there was an initiative in uh, Edmonton in, in Canada which uh, looked at homelessness and promoting a wellness in the central um, business district. And really the starting point that the council had was we need to create a new hub, um, a hub that's going to integrate all services. When um, the recover team spoke to homeless people experiencing homelessness, they didn't want a hub. When they spoke to other residents in town, they also didn't want further concentration of services in the town. So what they came up with through a year of very, very deep design with people was uh, 14 different prototypes, which better met both the needs of people experiencing homelessness, as well as a broader community. Um, so very briefly, how we're embedding these lessons. So we're at um, kind of four years into a journey of integration reform in Victoria and Australia. We've started, we've created uh, some devolved governance groups across our regional areas. And what I've heard and what we're going to implement is devolving more responsibility down to that level. Also, what we're going to do is build our capability in service design and co-production approaches, because once we get the kind of regionalization of service delivery correct, that's what's key to redesign our system. Thank you. I knew at some point today I was going to forget to go off mute when I started talking. It was bound to happen. Um, uh, thank you, Nick. I really appreciate that, and I, I really um. I find that concept of like the latent community assets piece really interesting too. I think we often, you know, try to reinvent the wheel or come up with new and there's things there that we can tap into. And that's the the power of the community and of the the end user, if you will, the client. So that's amazing. Thank you. Um, and we're going to come to you now. You've got a bit of a, a different role being with city council. Can you mm -hmm. talk about the work you're doing in Dublin and what you see is the role of government and public service in minimizing systemic barriers for those experiencing multiple disadvantage. And thank you for having me here. Um, in the social work section of the Dublin City Council, we, we really see an incident of people experiencing multiple disadvantages. We see that's increasing a lot. Um, and despite the efforts of the social safety net, there are systemic barriers still there to accessing services, especially for that particular cohort. And those include racism, poverty, disparity in the community and opportunities for education, disparities in health status, and that's in both mental health and physical health, perceived stigma and shame in needing social support, societal attitudes to those receiving support, for example, the idea that they're abusing the system, they're lazy, etc. Uh, complex application and eligibility processes make it very difficult for people to navigate through the systems. Unconscious bias can be there. Uh, there's lack of cooperation between agencies and the lack of representation and inclusion of the lived experience in designing policies at government level, I think. Um, the government and public services have a responsibility to take a strong leadership role in addressing all of those. But as a, as a service deliverer on the ground, I think there's two key areas that the government and public services need to build into the architecture of service delivery delivery and to those experiencing multiple disadvantage. I think it needs to be knitted in at the government level and they're both multi-agency cooperative working and co-production. And I'll just to answer your query of what we're doing in Dublin, I'll give you a very brief overview of an example of how we are using co-production and the importance of the lived experience in one of our services. We work with the traveller community and they're traditionally an Indigenous Irish nomadic group who experienced multiple disadvantages at a community and at an individual level. And I suppose I need to emphasize that travellers are not a homogenous group, and that's a mistake that's also often made by policymakers who often design one-size-fits-all services. And as a group, however, they, they do suffer significant discrimination, racism, negative attitudes, poor accommodation. They experience significant educational disadvantage and they find it difficult to get work in the formal economy. 
and there's also higher suicide rates in the settled population, poor mental health, poor physical health, and they're impacted by the drugs and alcohol addiction and they live in poorer environments that leave them more marginalized from the wider population. Now, our, my co-production example, I think, is a little bit different because our space is, is based in legislation, mm -hmm. which gives us a little bit more of an incentive to make it work. And the 1998 Housing Act makes it essential for, for local authorities to set up a local travel accommodation committee, which we call an LTACC for short. And it has to be made up, that has to include representation from travelers and mm -hmm. it has to include their lived experience. So our, it's made up of representatives from traveler advocate groups. Travelers represent the areas and the community that they live. Uh, there's made up of social workers and administrative officers and city councillors, and there is an independent chairperson. Its role is to advise city council in relation to providing accommodation for travellers. Uh, its role is also to prepare a, a four-year accommodation, traveller accommodation programme. Um, it looks at the overall management of accommodation for travellers and as a mechanism for transparency and accountability. And I suppose I'll just talk briefly about some of the challenges and successes and just the impact of it. Um, initially, it was very difficult dealing with the unrealistic expectations. I think sometimes when you include service users, they kind of think this is going to solve everything. But it's the wheels of bureaucracy grind pretty slow. And there's lots of rules and regulations that we have to meet to draw down funding from central government. And the travel community also would have had a lack of familiarity with planning laws and a lot of the bureaucratic parts of, of building and openness and transparency fund was very important in addressing that. Um, but the co conflicting expectations were often an issue. Sometimes there might be land that was not suitable for, for building due to flood risk, but there might have been unofficial traveler site there for many years. So it was hard to get the point across that while it was there unofficially and we kind of turned a blind eye that we couldn't actually build on it. Um, Initially, I suppose expectations were high when travellers joined, but building trust between officials and travellers took a bit of time. Their perceptions of the local authority was poor due to what they saw as inaction and lack of interest over the years. So they didn't have a lot of faith that we would deliver much. And when you build trust, maintaining trust can be a bit challenging. Sometimes it's easy in the beginning to get a win, but then it's harder to maintain it as you go forward. So there is sometimes difficult to achieve. So small wins were important, I think, as we went along to maintain trust and to show that there was some progress. Um, addressing unconscious bias became an issue as well because culture, we did cultural competency training delivered by one of the travel groups to all DCC staff involved with the travelers. And it made us more culturally aware and, and more able to build a culturally appropriate service and to address unconscious bias. The lack of an effectiveness of engagement was challenging and frustrating for everybody. And we had a number of workshops and an independent review to look at this and see how we would work better together. We needed to build capacity in the traveller community. We found that after one or two attendants, a lot of the traveller reps didn't attend. Um, we paid their expenses for attending and the development groups addressed capacity. And we, we allowed two travellers from each site to come for peer support and to build confidence. Um, and that actually, to, that, I suppose, helped us to identify a lot of systemic barriers. In fact, uh, there's a power imbalance with people who people who have multiple disadvantages don't have any power. The stigma and history of racism led travelers, I think, to feel to feel the things they wanted that couldn't be accommodated were as a result of racism, where in actual fact, sometimes they just couldn't be done. Um, but in, in our case, the traveler community were empowered because we, we couldn't progress projects without their input. And in terms of building housing on sites, we couldn't progress without the agreement of residents. So that actually gave them balance the power out a little bit. So uh, we also found we had to safeguard traveller reps because most of them lived on the sites they were representing. And there was a lot of pressure on them locally to deliver and to deliver quickly and a lot of anger when they weren't able to do so. So in our experience, co-production was very meaningful and a very affected real change, but it was at times quite challenging for all the participants. And it, in our case, it may have succeeded as well as it did because we, there was a statutory requirement to make it work. When it failed and broke down, we had to go back and start again. Um, 
to, for for us, there there was an overall, I suppose, I think I'd like to highlight this an overall gain for the organization as well as for the participants. There was a reduction in antisocial behavior and dumping in many of our sites. We made fewer mistakes because we took on board the lived experience and there was a financial saving and a much better, more respectful relationship between staff and tenants. And it helped us to identify systemic barriers and to be more preemptive, I think, in addressing problems and challenges before they arose. And service users themselves were empowered to take responsibility and ownership of what happened in their environment. And they had a say in, they had a real say in housing issues. So that, that it gave us an opportunity, I think, to, to move also from just looking at site development and building to look at community needs like play spaces for children, community development. And we've now be begun to look at ways of supporting travelers to participate in the circular economy. So I think the key learning I say is keep going, address the challenges creatively and make it make it work. Just stick with it. Thank you, Anne. That's that's fantastic, um, and I you know I I think it's implicit and implied, but you you raise trust and mm -hmm. the building of that trust relationship, which is obviously a key piece. It's mm -hmm. with service providers as well, but with government in particular, it can be a, a real challenge um, to overcome what can be decades of of a different relationship that's, mm -hmm. that's not always a friendly one. So really appreciate you bringing that up as well, um, Ben. You have an interesting role as a commissioner. And I'd like to ask what you see as the role of the commissioner in supporting an ecosystem focused on addressing multiple disadvantage. Where do you see government needing to lean in and where does it need to let its community partners lead and innovate? Uh, thank you, Charlene, and thank you for having me here today. Um, um, it's interesting, isn't it? Because um, you, diff you say commissioner and then there are about, you know, I don't know how many people are here today, but they've probably got that many different definitions. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm a very simple man and I, I have a very simple view of my job. I think a commissioner is somebody who should understand need and ensure that need is met. It is not about buying things. That's procurement. Um, so my role is very much, I think, around being a system leader and to be honest in the roles of addressing the issues of complex needs i think some of that leading needs to be leading by getting out of the way um because communities um can be supported to address the needs most effectively quite frequently um but I'm, i see myself as a system leader a convener and a coordinator and by building clear a clear understanding within the system of the system and 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 what the needs are and ensuring that the resources are brought to bear most effectively to address those needs that is the, and, and the solution is rarely to just buy something or enhance existing services and it's understanding all of those nuances um, that enable, I think, an effective commissioner to, to to get the job done and to ensure that outcomes are met. Um, government, um, they could do well with lead, leading by getting out of the way. Actually, um, longer, longer, and more sustainable funding sites, uh, cycles. Um, the short-term funding is the is really crushes quite a lot of innovation, um, and we lobby hard on behalf of. Um, our local area, but also on behalf of the, the sort of agenda for longer term, more sustainable and more flexible funding. Um, it is clear, high, highly defined and really tight funding delivered to localities does not allow for quite often innovation. And as a commissioner, I spend a lot of my time trying to tie a lever something that is right for our area into a funding stream that doesn't necessarily meet that need. Um, so some so longer term, more sustainable and more flexible funding and less siloed approach to the to the delivery of funding. Um, and driving that I the idea that, that that this has to be done in partnership, this has to be about yeah. building systems. There is no that it is rare that any one organization will address the needs of the individuals that we're discussing today. And it, it is about bringing those together, but you need to then bring the funding together. You need to stop sending funding down through um, isolated silos and, and clear silos. Um, so those would be the keys for me, really. I think my role is very much around a convener, coordinator and leader. Fantastic. Yeah, that, that's great. I, you know, it's um, 
I, I keep writing notes because I'm hearing the same the same themes coming out, um, which was not unexpected, right? But I think it reinforces the things that really matter. And it is about partnership, it's collaboration, it's coordination, it's leadership, it's engagement of, of um, you know, participants, citizens, individual service users. So, um, and then the challenges I think are the same, right? It is siloed funding, um, fragmented systems and, and delivery systems and the challenge of trying to bring those together on the back end. So I'm really appreciating this. I am, um, you know, watching the time and again, want to be really respectful of everybody on here. And so what I'd like to do, I, you know, I certainly have several more questions I could ask and I might still, but I actually wouldn't mind moving to the Q&A if the panel is okay with that, because there are um, a couple of questions on here that I, I just want to make sure we have time to get to. Um, I think the first one I'm going to ask is actually to you, Nick. Um, and it, it relates to the context of the question related to sort of the scalability piece that you were talking about. And, you know, there's many examples where a locally developed initiative is successful. Um, so governments scale and expand to other locations and they become more bureaucratic. And, and so the question is, do you have any thoughts regarding the tension between local design and flexibility and scalability and consistency? It's a big it's question. A really good question and it came up a little bit and um i'm going to answer it through the lens of changing futures so please others speak up um who have more experience in the actual implementation but one thing i liked about fulfilling lives and changing futures that came after was that it tested themes across systems and by themes i mean no wrong door approach peer support workers and those type of things so the idea is we're not saying that this was a really good model of working with families in one place and now it has to be all over England. We're saying that we need to push our systems to better respond to multiple complexity. And the way we think we do that is through these um, kind of, there's probably a better word, but like let's say themes, um, at things like no wrong door approaches. And with funding and being dedicated to those themes and learning from each of these locations, what, how are we pushing our systems to better respond? Um, and I think when another kind of key takeaway when we're talking about uh, multiple and complex needs, the system is already so complex. So we're not talking about a whole of system redesign. What we're talking about is how can we look at people within those systems and make life better for them and stop being so uh, systems focused and how can we be more people's focus? And I feel like um, changing mm -hmm. futures is the beginning of that in terms of a, like a, a long-term focus. That's a, that's a great answer. Did, um, you know, Andy, Louise, Ben, you, you've got experience with changing futures. Did you want to add anything to Nick's response? Yeah, Charlene, I think oh, I put it in the chat. I think it's, um, I mean, I think the word... I would use is is principles. You're testing principles and testing the approach and the actual design of the delivery needs to be locally focused, locally sensitive, sensitive to the needs of the communities that you are looking to work with. It is the principles of the approach that you're testing. And I think sometimes the problem with scaling is that you try to scale the exact model rather than scale and share the principles. And I think, yes, I think, Nick, you're right. I think Changing Futures has been quite an, a, 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 an exceptional approach to this, exceptional as in very different, um, because I think they have looked at developing a set of principles, developing an approach, not building a model, because the minute you build a model, it will not work everywhere. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, Louise, since you're on camera, I have a, a question uh, going back to you and, and your presentation. So, like, we know there's systemic challenges related to legislation, culture, commissioning practice, and these are often seen as too big to change. And I think, you know, we certainly heard through the panel some different ways that things have been tackled, but definitely a, a common theme. To what extent should we be trying to put effort to change some of these overarching challenges? How much of this needs political leadership? in your opinion? Well, a lot of it, I'll be honest, as Ben said, as been said, I mean, through Changing Futures, I know we're talking lots about Changing Futures, but 
through changing futures it's not just about looking at local need and influencing commissioners from all sectors you know because it is overseen by the department of leveling up and um, of housing communities we have a government voice so the 15 areas that are under changing futures are feeding up experiences um, situations, outcomes locally. So it is going back up to where the decision makers are sitting. And the aim of Changing Futures is also to look at policy, look at that change, not just locally and changing the landscape, but also taking that back up to the people that can actually make that decision. So yes, government do need to sit in there and make the changes. And like Ben and, and Nick and Andy alluded to, is that, you know, yes, we can make a system and I think we can make a programme and make it a pilot, but actually the impact has been huge. We've known that locally. And I think the advantage of changing futures is, like Ben said about principles, is that we've chosen to deliver it this way within the remit of the programme. But the other 14 areas within changing futures have done it differently, but mm -hmm. still with the same outcomes. And I think the biggest learning out of this, and I think the government will take away, is that, it doesn't matter if we're down in Essex or up in Manchester or in Hull, wherever we are in the country, the same issues are coming up time and time and time and time again. And I I'm, I'm imagine that's everywhere. So the fact that they've got all this evidence coming in from a whole country over these 50, you know, it's so relevant that they can't ignore it. I think they're at a stage where they can't and I think they don't want to. I think that's how I feel anyway, what I've experienced from it, from the learning. That's that's fantastic, Louise. And, you know, Alfonso, I, I know you're on. Uh, we, we've got to close out in a second, but if we can take 30 seconds. Anne or Andy, did you want to add anything around um, the need for political leadership and the importance of that in the work you're doing? Yeah, I I, sorry. I, I think I think that there is it's essential to have political leadership because there, there are only there's only so much you can actually change at a local level. Like, for example, with our organization, we only have influence over Double City Council. We don't have influence over a broader scale. We're totally constrained by the bureaucratic uh, funding process. And as someone mentioned earlier, it's extremely siloed. Any any one family alone could have be attending three or four different services and each of them could have a different funding stream. And the, what happens with funding streams are so narrow like that is that you get gaps in services, but they're nobody's responsible for them. And you need you need people who are at the top to kind of see those overarching pieces and look at the big picture and pull it all together. Um, we would have we have city councillors in our co-production um, example that I gave, and we try to put a lot of pressure on them to, to feed back up the line to their own political parties to try and bring about change. But it's, it's difficult sometimes to know if it's been heard. You feed back information, but you don't always get feedback. So you don't know yeah. really whether it's been taken on board or whether it hasn't been. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Andy, second last word. <laughs> I'll be very brief. Similar to Anne, and, and Ben talked earlier about the silo. And I think, you know, that silo in that Ben's experiencing at a local authority level, it starts from governments. It's those governments, departments that are siloing. So the solution has to be that cross government work because so many different these the, the people experiencing multiple disadvantage by the system it cuts across so many different government departments it's those departments working together and getting that kind of shared responsibility i think we've seen early positive signs of that but start of a journey on that a long way to go Thank you so very much. Thank you all the panelists, all the speakers for sharing today. I know we just scratched the surface on what's a, a very um um deep and wide <laughs> issue for everyone across the world. So thank you so, so much. Um, Alfonso, I'm going to turn it over to you now. Many thanks, uh, Charlene. Many thanks to all our speakers today. Uh, Louise was saying, um, earlier, no matter whether we are in Essex or Manchester, the issues we're facing are very similar. And indeed, no matter whether we are in the UK, Ireland, Canada, the issues raised uh, by our panelists were very similar indeed, showing the added value of workshops like ours today. Indeed, this has been a truly global webinar with colleagues from Europe, Canada, Australia, New Zealand. I'd like to thank Josh Kjartersson, uh, Global Leader of Human Services with Deloitte and Charlene, uh, Director of Deloitte Human Social Services for our regular cooperation and partnership that we want to, of course, continue reinforcing as we move forward. And a big thanks also to Luis, Mario, Andy, Nick, and, and Ben for agreeing to speak today. 
Uh, plenty has been said, and, and we are now uh, closing the webinar, but if I need to highlight a message, I'd say that social services work on a daily basis with people who face multiple disadvantages, for whom sometimes there is so much stigma that they may not be able to look for the right type of support. Reaching out to people in difficult situations and doing so in partnership across sectors and services is crucial. But it is also crucial to support practitioners, to encourage and to promote working in partnership with people themselves in a co-produced approach, which is based on people's own experience of care and uh, support. This uh, co-production approach is fundamental to tailor support to people's needs, wishes and assets, as it also responds to both a moral and an economic imperative. From the conversation with our panelists just now, uh, it is clear that there are a number of barriers. Most of them are systems made because our focus for so long has been on systems. Uh, we've, but we've realized that a one size fits all approach does, it just doesn't necessarily work for everybody. Uh, we need a localized, a personalized approach to address those barriers, to be able to build trust, focus on accessibility, to have people involved, asking them what their views are, because this means that we are then able to understand what do those needs are to be able to fulfill uh, people's outcomes. So this is, I'd say, the key takeaway from, from my side. And I'd like again to thank you all for, for this uh, great webinar. And I wish you the very best for the rest of the day. Take care.